Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, which, Lord, we treasure above everything. And, Lord, as we now, Lord, dive into your word, we pray that you would, Father, just uh, minister to us, be the second voice that's speaking this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 45, verse 17. 45, verse 17. Here we go. Tom and Sue, good morning. Okay. Genesis 45, verse 17. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye. Laid your beasts. Go, get you into the land of Canaan. Take your father and take your father and your households and come unto me. And I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat of the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take ye wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, for your wives, bring your father and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. The children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner 10 asses laden with the good things of Egypt, 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed, and he said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. <laughs> Okay, now, what we have been studying here is this great invitation. This is the invitation. Very significant time, very significant point in the history of the Jewish people. Why? Because here Pharaoh is making this invitation for them to come down to Egypt. That's what we're seeing in verse 19 when he said, You're, this, th 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 Thou art commanded, this do ye. He says, take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, your wives, and bring your father. And then this great invitation where Pharaoh, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt says, come. And from this invitation now, the Jewish people will spend 400 years in a new land, in a new uh, a, a land for them, Egypt. I mean, that's a long time. I mean, just think about it. That's twice the time, twice the amount of time that the U.S. has been a nation about. And it looked very good to the Jewish people. It looked very good when they arrived and they came to the most lush area in Egypt and they were told, this is your new home. I mean, can't you imagine how those brothers, when they arrived there, and they, they arrive in this uh, Egyptian uh, Goshen there, this, this Egyptian Garden of Eden to be nourished by the ruler of Egypt and they must have thought to themselves, that's a great new home. You know, some of the brothers, you know, if not all of them, when they saw Goshen, they might have said something like, very nice, very nice. I could get used to this. And, and I mean, and they probably thought, you know, who needs Canaan with all the drought and the dust? And, 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 and here we are in this most beautiful, lush banks of the River Nile, and this is going to be my new home? I don't think I ever want to see Canaan again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of finish with Canaan. Did you know that when, when, when um, Herzl was, uh, was, was, uh, was promoting a Jewish homeland, did you know where he wanted it to be? <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't Israel, what we know as Israel today. Did you know where it was? Uganda. It was Uganda. <laughs> I've been to Uganda. It's not bad. Very nice. Lots of banana trees. You know, that's where he wanted. But anyway, but it, it, that would have been an Egypt for them. Because Egypt also, well, well, not to say this about Uganda, but Egypt was a land that was filled with idolatry, filled with sensual pleasures, Cleopatra and all. And everything that God hates... And the Jewish people were in danger of loving Egypt, so just like Christians are in danger of loving the world. So God had a remedy for that problem. Enter one new Pharaoh from Exodus 1.8. Why didn't they say it? Well, Exodus 1.8. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So God's remedy for Israel to not make Egypt their real home was a new king over Egypt, that which knew not, knew not Joseph. Now, seeing Israel had come into this beautiful region is a picture of what happens to us, especially for us who live in San Diego, America's finest city. 
I mean, just like Israel, we're in danger of also saying, very nice, very nice, I can get used to this. This is kind of like heaven on earth. I think I'll just make this my new home and, and be like the one tribe that said, I don't think we have, I want to go over the River Jordan there. This is a nice place. But and just like God had a remedy for Israel not to becoming too comfortable, so God has a remedy for us to not become too comfortable, and they're called trials. Trials. So, so, so Egypt coming in here, going through this whole history that we're beginning here of 400 years there, it reminds me of a flight I took one time, and I may have told you this. Anyway, and I sat next to an Egyptian man. An Egyptian man was sitting next to me on the seat, and we got to talking, and he told me he was from Egypt. And I said, oh, Egypt, my people spent a lot of time in your country, I told him. I said, oh, yes, it was beautiful. I said, the place that your Pharaoh gave to my people was outstanding, and your people were so hospitable. You even gave us a VIP transport from our old country to bring our people to your country. Oh, it was wonderful. And, and, I, and he's kind of scratching his head saying, well, what is he talking about? And I said, oh, no, your Pharaoh gave to my people people, the top eastern part of the River Nile, right there at the delta before it empties into the Mediterranean. It was very nice for cattle. See, my people had cattle. And it was very nice for agriculture. Boy, were my people happy at your place. It was so nice, at least in the beginning. I told him, I said, a couple hundred years, everything was just perfect. But then I think maybe we wore out our welcome. I don't know. But because a new pharaoh came along, and, and he didn't like my people, and he wanted, well, he wanted pyramids of all things, you know, so many pyramids he wanted. And so my people had to build these pyramids and pyramids, and, and then he imposed a kind of population control, and that wasn't very nice. And so the pyramids, the population control, and I told him, I said, we just wanted to leave, but your pharaoh didn't want us to leave. And finally we left. And our leaving from your country was so famous, a book was written about it. Can you believe it? I said, and you know what the title of the book is? The Leaving. <laughs> That's the title of the book. It became a famous bestseller, I told him. And the amazing thing about it was I was talking and going on all this. He had no idea who I was what I was talking about. He didn't know. Until I said, we had a very famous leader to bring us out of your country, and his name was Moses. Then he said, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Actually, we cannot overlook how important verse 19 is because this invitation where Egypt hosts Israel for hundreds of years is where it is the time when Israel will grow from a people of around 70, a little more than 70 people to millions of people. And this is going to be the greatest honor and the glory for the country of Egypt when they were so hospitable to God's people, the Jewish people. But the greatest shame of Egypt was when they turned against and started to systematically kill the Jewish people. And in this sense, Egypt is very much like Germany. Because we talk a lot about the Holocaust of Germany and how so the greatest shame of Germany is when they systematically killed the Jewish people. But just like with Egypt, we should never forget all the hundreds of years where Germany was very hospitable to the Jewish people. Jews flourished in Germany. Uh, and, and during those years, Germany was very good to the Jewish people. So from heaven's perspective, that was the time of Germany's greatest honor and glory when they were good to God's people. Now, we come now in, in our study here to verse 21, and this is the first time, there, there's something in verse 21, I want you to look at verse 21, and you tell me, what is there in, ver, in, in, in this verse, you know, it, 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 verse, you see there, verse, uh, verse 21, yeah, what is there in verse 21 that appears for the first time in the Bible and is going to continue on, what is there? You tell me. Verse 21, there's a first, Genesis filled with, filled with firsts, but there's a special first in verse 21. Anybody see it? Okay, you mean to take the wagons and so forth? Oh, the commandment. Oh, commandment. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe that is the first one. Yeah, another first one then. <laughs> I mean, Genesis is the beginning. is. Okay. Anybody see it? The first time they're called what? 
The, what translation are you using? <laughs> children of Israel. The first time they're called the children of Israel. That's right. Now, have you ever thought about that? I mean, have you ever thought? That's the first time in the Bible that the Jewish people are called the children of Israel. And so, it's, it, it, have you ever thought about that? I mean, how surprising this is for a title for the Jewish people. I mean, there's Clint, and there's Cody, and what if we say, well, they are the children of Mr. Cody. <laughs> they're, they're children. I mean, grown people like, like, like Clint and, 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 and Cody being called children, children. I mean, it's such an interesting title that God has chosen to call the Jewish people. He's, he's chosen to call them children. Children of Israel. Now, why would God do that? Why would God call this, the people the children? I mean, it reminds me of a time when I was in Japan and, and our company's pres, Japanese president and I, we, we had just arrived by train from Tokyo to, to Osaka. We were going to a business meeting and, and we were getting, you know, in, in Japan, being on time for a business meeting is absolutely vital and paramount, you know, as I learned the hard way. But anyway, we, 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 were, we were, so, you know, always the constantly, you know, with the time, conscious of time. And, uh, well, it's not this anymore, and now it's this. But anyway, constantly the time, you know. And so... So, so like I said, we just so we well, we might make sure we get there on time. So we get into the taxi, and we don't know what the traffic's like or anything. So, so our Japanese president he asked the taxi driver, "How long will it take for us to arrive at uh, you know Doshimachi Street there in in, in, in Osaka? How long is it going to take?" And the taxi driver just told him it was going to take about 20 minutes. So, so he, he, he turned to me, our, our friend, of Japanese president, he turned to me and he said these words, Mr. Driver said that it will take about 20 minutes. And when he said that to me, Mr. Driver, I started to laugh. I said, Mr. Driver, I said, well, we'll, we'll, I, I said, well, we'll tell him that Mr. Passenger says thank you. <laughs> I, I mean... <clears throat> I thought, it's so much like a child to say, Mr. Driver. And I thought, that's Japan. Japan is a company, a country of children, of children. And that's how God has chosen to call the Jewish people, children, children of Israel. I mean, they may be 85 years old, but he's going to still call them children. And God has chosen to call his people children. And that's what makes it so important for us to see what God sees in children that, that, that help us to understand why he's chosen to do that. And unfortunately, we have this account of the Lord Jesus when he encounters children in Mark 10, 13. Mark 10, 13 is so interesting because it's the encounter of the Lord Jesus with children where it says in Mark 10, 13, and they brought, unto, they brought young children to him. They brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer, little children, to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Now, here were, here were children. Here were children. They were brought to the Lord Jesus. And this was an opportunity for us, for everyone, to see his attitude toward children. And to see the Lord Jesus here with the children gives us insight into why Jehovah Jesus has chosen to call his Jewish people children or his people children in Genesis 45, 45, 21 here. The children of Israel. So in this account in Mark 10, 13, we're not told who brought these children to the Lord Jesus, but we can assume it was their parents. I mean, why not? But the, and there were instances in the gospel where concerned parents came to the Lord Jesus to, to, that he would heal their sick bodies. But these parents were not bringing their sick children to the Lord Jesus for healing. They were asking the Lord to, 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 to do something not uh, different from healing their sick children. They want the Lord Jesus to touch them. 
They want him to touch their, their children. In Matthew's account, it says how, how they asked the Lord to put his hands on them and pray for them. I mean, his parents didn't come with a concern for the bodies of their children. They came with a concern for the souls of their children. These parents wanted it to be well with their souls of their children. And so they brought their children to the Lord so he would bless them. It's, you know, it, it's, and it wasn't easy for these parents. They had to battle through the obstacle of the disciples' protest, not wanting them to bring their children. But these parents were determined, and they, they determined they broke through that opposition because these parents had an intense desire for their children to be close to the Lord and for the Lord to be close to them. These are amazing parents. And now, the idea of someone putting his hands on children to pray for them, that's not foreign. That's not foreign to the Bible because that's what Jacob did. That's what the, 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 the father Jacob did. He put his hands on Joseph's children. We're going to see that. We're going to come to that. Genesis 48, 14. Genesis 48, 14 where it says, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh. Head. Those were Joseph's children. And this is what these parents wanted the Lord Jesus to do. Just like Jacob put his hands on his grandsons there. The Lord Jesus wanted, they, they, the parents wanted the Lord Jesus to put his hands on their children and pray for them. It's such a precious picture. It's such a precious picture because the picture of parents bringing their children who are not yet capable of reaching their hands, little hands out to God. So, so parents are asking the Lord Jesus to reach his hands out to them. And that's what parents do when they bring their little children to church. And, 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 and so they can learn about God. They can have God in their lives. And when their children who are not yet able to reach out their hands to God, and these parents bring them so the, and they're asking the Lord to reach his hands down to the children, that's a picture of intercess, intercessory prayer. That's what we do when we intercede. When we intercede for others, oftentimes we're asking the Lord to reach to those who are not able to reach out to him. That's what intercessory prayer looks like, especially for the lost. And, and, and all we can say about these parents who brought their children to the Lord is that these are smart parents. These are very smart parents because they knew that the highest priority for their children was to get close to the Lord Jesus these, these parents could not have done better for their children than to bring them to the Lord. And parents could not do worse for their children than to not bring them to the Lord today. And it breaks my heart today to see, to see children raised without God. We have a whole generation that's grown up without God. And another generation that is growing up now without God. It's the grand experiment of the devil that had the devil has put into the minds of these parents, the grand experiment to see this is what Europe has been engaged on, the great experiment to bring up generations without God. You know, Sunday school was not originally instituted for adults. Sorry to say, folks. <laughs> and Sunday school was not originally instituted for children for Christian homes. Because it was the Christian homes who were the, that was the center for the teaching about God. So there was no need for Sunday school for adults and for children because, they, because the teaching was in the homes. Sunday school was instituted for children from non-Christian homes so that those children could learn about God. Sunday school was an outreach to the lost children to give them the teaching that Christian children's already received in their, in their homes. And it's unbelievable today that child evangelism fellowship that should be flooded with volunteers for teachers now has a large number of schools right here in San Diego where permission has been granted by those public schools to allow children to be taught about God on the public school campuses and there are no teachers. There are no teachers to be found, no teachers for the after-school five-day clubs or even vacation Bible school. And this is the greatest need for the future of our country. The greatest need for the future of the U.S. is not to teach children more science 
or, or more literature or more arts. The greatest need for our country is to teach them more God. Why? Because Hosea 4.6 is turning out to be true of our country. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. And we're experiencing this type of destruction from within, from a lack of knowledge of God, a people today who don't know who God is. It says in Amos 8.11, Amos 8.11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a famine of thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. So we're experiencing today a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. This is not to say that people don't know something about the Bible. It's not to say that, that people have not been exposed to the Bible, but there is a difference from knowing about the Bible and hearing the words of the Lord in the Bible. And there's a difference between knowing what the Bible is about and actually hearing God speak through the Bible to the soul. And that's what there's a famine of in our land today. And these, these parents, they understood this need for their children to be close to the Lord Jesus, and so they bring them, they bring their children to the Lord Jesus. What a picture this is. This is what good parents do. They care for their children. What a picture this is of care. What we should do also, Peter made this promise, or Peter made this statement about the promise of salvation when he said in Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, repent ye, be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is unto you and to your children, to your children. Lays an obligation on them, a responsibility. God wants the children to be saved. He told that. The prophet Isaiah told that to Israel when he said in Isaiah 44.3, Isaiah 44.3, he said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. That's the next generation. <clears throat> Reminds me one time I was talking to a, <coughs> a lost person and he just had a baby and I told him, well, what you need to do for that baby is you need to get saved yourself so that you can then bring your child to the Lord. Now, the disciples, they, they, they were trying to stop the children from coming and, 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 they, and, and they didn't want that. And, and, and now the question becomes, but I wonder how old these children were that are being referred to in this passage, Mark. I wonder, how, were they 12-year-olds? Well, we can get an idea how old they were when we look at Mark 10, 13, because they're called young children, young children. And then the Lord refers to them in the next verse, Mark 10, 14, he calls them little children. And then the next verse in Mark 10, 15 says that he took them up in his arms, so since he took these young little children up in his arms, it leads us to believe they were young. I mean, no, no, you bring, you have, you have plural children, you're going to take them in your arms. How old are they? About one to four years old, somewhere in that range, one to four years old. That's the age group that the Lord is referring to, maybe one to four years old. He's speaking of one to four-year-olds, and he says that <clears throat> every person needs to be like a one to four-year-old in receiving the kingdom of God. Now, you know, and, and he says, unless you become like a one to four year old, you can't enter heaven. I mean, imagine that. No one can go to heaven unless they become like a one to four year old. And, and, and that, that, the one to four year olds, he said, he said, he said right now, they're the ones who are, uh, the people in heaven are like one to four year olds. That's the age group. A person has to be, here's what he said Matthew 18 3. Matthew 18 3. And said, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, same term, little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's what he said. He said, you've got to become like a one to four year old to enter heaven. So when you think, I want you to think now of a one to four year old. See, it's not hard for Clint to think of that. But <laughs> if you think of a one to four year old, what attributes do you see in a one to four year old that you think the Lord was referring to? I don't think he was referring to temper tantrums. 
<laughs> Unless you throw a temper tantrum, you can't get into heaven. I don't think so. So what is it about the one to four-year-olds, apart from the temper tantrum, that, that the Lord would be referring to when he says you've got to become like that? You've got to have that attribute to go to heaven. What do you think? Boy, you got a lot of things there. <laughs> so, okay. All right. So, you, you talked about joy, and then you talked about receiving, and then you talked about believing. Okay. And then you talked about trusting. Trust. Okay. So, we got, I can't, lost track already. Joy, re, uh, receiving, believing, trust. What did you say, Clint? I mean, uh, Tim? bigger hand. I got this one I can keep going on. All right. Not always. <laughs> huh? A need. Okay, a need. Okay, they, they know a need. Okay, now these are good. Now let's kind of take these a little bit. <clears throat> so Diana, Diana, you're not from Mexico, so you're Diana. But anyway, um, Diana has said receiving, receive. That would refer to an openness, an openness on the part of a, of a young child. The Lord holds out this openness as something we should be like, an openness. You know, children are like a, a white piece of a, a, a blank paper, you know, and, 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 and they're just waiting for, for to be written on. You know, they open up and they, they, they're shown and they're taught and, and they don't come with these preconceived ideas and these prejudices, you know. And that's the way the Lord wants us to be when we come to him. When in the Bible, in the morning, for example, we open the Bible, he wants us to come without preconceived ideas and without prejudices, with a heart that's like an open white piece of blank paper ready for God to write the truths on the tables of our heart. And, 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 then, uh, and then Diana has mentioned, believe, believe. Children have a tremendous capacity to believe. I mean, tremendous. I mean, that's why a child's imagination is incredible. I mean, you tell a young child that God made everything, just believes it. You know, he doesn't get this troubled look on his face and struggling inside and come back to you. Well, can you reconcile that with Darwin's theory of evolution? <laughs> <laughs> into that. Uh, it just has a it's very uncomplicated uh, capacity to believe. And that's the way God wants us to come to him, believing. If you told a child that, well, look, you know, God created everything in six literal days, the child wouldn't say, well, well maybe we should get a new definition for day. Maybe we don't understand day. Maybe it's a billion years or, uh, you know, he just believes it. And, and when we read the Bible, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us just to believe. And then you mentioned, it's been mentioned trust a couple of times. Children have a tremendous ability to trust. I mean, they know, they, they know they're little. You know, they look up at us. We must look like towering giants. And they don't try to pretend to be grown-ups. They just look for help. And children have no trouble crying out for help. That's what a baby does when he's born. He's crying out. Anything is a problem. Whatever it might be, he's crying out. You know what blocks a person from getting help from God is they don't come to him. Why? Because of pride, pride, intellectual pride. Children don't have pride. I mean, and, and if a one-year-old problem has a problem, he's going to cry out. And, and, and the one-year-old is not going to sit there and say, well, let's see, I think I can figure this out for myself. Let me just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't need any help from anybody. Just leave me alone. That's not what a child does. And in the same way, God wants us to cry out to him for help. I mean, he knows better than we do how much we need help. And he's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to call to him, as he says in Jeremiah 33, 3. Jeremiah 33, 3, where he says, call unto me. I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And he says in Jeremiah 29, 12, 29, 12, then you shall call upon me. You shall go and pray unto me, and I'll hearken unto you. Children have this tremendous ability to cry out for help and to trust and depend. And then I think, Diane, you also said, Diana, you also said joy or happy, happy. That's true. Children are basically happy. You know, you don't see a child that's born depressed. You know, and whenever I see, it's amazing to me, whenever I see kids at, at Rady's Children's Hospital with cancer 
or the kids at St. Jude's, you know, have cancer, they have deformed limbs, or they have missing limbs, and, and they're struggling to walk or play, they're happy. That's the amazing thing. They just look happy. I mean, every, everyone else is crying, you know, but the children are happy. They're just doing the best they can do, and they're, 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 they're happy with what they can do, and, and they're not sad for what they can't do. They're just trying. Like my two-and-a-half-year-old grandson, Colton, with leukemia, who today, right now, he's in Rady's Hospital. He's undergoing the worst mega chemotherapy right now with intraspinal injections of vancristine and methotrexate, while at the same time getting high to 100 times more dose of methotrexate intravenously. And everybody is anxious around him. Him? He's just tired. He's sleeping. And then we remember the little three-year-old Ivy you know, was going through the chemo for her leukemia. And, and from her perspective, it was like, oh, it's a bad day today. Oh, it's a better day today. I can play. And, and children are basically happy. And that's what God wants to see in our lives. He wants to see happiness. He wants to see what the Bible calls rejoicing. I mean, Moses commanded Israel to rejoice in Deuteronomy 16.11. Deuteronomy 16.11, Moses said, Thou shalt rejoice, that's a command, before the Lord thy God, thy, thou and thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, the Levi that is within thy gates, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow that are among you. And then King David gave the same command to the people when he said in Psalm 32.11, Psalm 32.11, Be glad. In the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And Isaiah, Isaiah made a personal commitment to be happy and joyful when he said in Isaiah 61:10, Isaiah 61:10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, before he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments. And Paul commanded us. In Philippians 4.4, Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, as if he had to say it again. Children have this tremendous capacity to be happy and glad. There's another thing that, 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 that children have, and that is they have this tremendous capacity to live in the present. Children live in the present. They don't worry about the future. I mean, that's how kids can be happy because they're living in the present. You know, like, again, these kids with cancer, with leukemia, my, my grandson, he's got a three and a half year course of chemo ahead of him. Ten different chemos he's going to get in the spine, in the IV. We're all worried about his future. He's not worried about his future, he just lives in the present. It's either a day he feels bad or a day he doesn't feel as bad. Sometimes he plays. That's the child's ability to live in the present, free from the anxieties about the future. That's what God wants for us. He says, really, that's what the emphasis was when the Lord Jesus said, Matthew 6.25, Matthew 6.25, it's all about living in the present when he said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, that what you shall eat or what you shall drink, for your, or, or, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the body more than meat, the body more than raiment? Look at the fowls of the air. They sow not, they neither do they reap, they don't gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not better, much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic to your stature? Why take you thought for the raiment? He says, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? See, all these emphasis on the word shall is speaking about the future. It's worrying about the future. What's going to happen to me in the future? And our troubles, we have troubles that are new every morning. Every morning we have a new trouble. But you know what else is new every morning? What? God's mercies. See, Lamentations 3.22. Lamentations 3.22. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It's good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. 
Our troubles, they're new every morning, but so are God's mercies. And they're what we should look at when the new trouble comes is say, that's a new adventure. I wonder how God's going to help me through this trial. A new trial is a new opportunity to see a new mercy from God, and a new mercy from God is a new opportunity to praise him for that. The greatest mercies that came to Israel was when they were facing their greatest trials. I mean, just think of the parting of the Red Sea moments before they were going to be slaughtered by the Egyptian army. Now, another thing that children are very, uh, an attribute of children, is that they are aware when something is too great for them. You know, children, when the chair is too high, you know, they're not, well, some kids try to climb up to it. Most just say, no, that's too, I'm staying away from that especially after they fall off at the first time. And, and, and that's what God wants to see in us, an awareness when something is too great, too much for us, and we back away. That's what David said, King David said in Psalm 131.1. 1. Psalm 131.1, 1, David said, Lord, my heart is not haughty, that would be proud and arrogant, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in, in, in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely as I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned from his mother, my soul is even as a weaned child. <laughs> okay, so that's what God wants to see in us. Children, are, they're, 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 they're free from the anxiety of the future. They're open to, to, and believing and trusting. And so God uses them. God uses little children. He says that in Matthew 21, 16. Matthew 21, 16 says, Jesus saith unto him, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou a perfected praise? You know what that verse means? That verse means that not only are we to teach children, we are to listen to children because God speaks through them. Because children have all these attributes, these great attributes, God loves them. And, and that's why the Lord gave children this great welcome in Mark 10, 14, when he says, suffer the little children to come unto me, forbid them not. That's a great welcome. It's extended to any adult who will become like a one to four-year-old and have those same attributes. So these parents in Mark 10, 13, they wanted the Lord to touch uh, their children or put his hands on them. And what does he do? Not just touch them. He takes them into his arms. I mean, what a scene of the great Messiah taking these little children into his arms. It's the same scene that we have of him in Isaiah 40, verse 11. Isaiah 40, verse 11 said, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. And gently lead those that are with young. I mean, that's a great scene. The great Messiah taking children in his arms. Now, by contrast, the disciples, they protested. And they said, they looked at the little children and said, oh, no. Dirty diapered, sniveling, unsophisticated. <laughs> they thought, these children are always in the way. They're disturbing us from our higher conversations with the Lord. We can't let this door open. There's just too many children in Israel. They'll just be bringing them left and right. We've got to nip it all in the bud and say no. Now, that, that, that spirit the Lord was very displeased with. He was very displeased with their attitude toward children because the attributes that children have are the attributes that the Lord wants to see in those who come to him. And that's the reason why he calls the Jewish people the children of Israel. And this is the first time we see it here in verse 21. And from this point on, the Jewish people will be called the children of Israel 647 times in the Bible. That sounds like a lot of times. Because the Lord wants the people to come to him with the attributes of a one to four-year-old, with an openness, with a believingness, with a trust, trustfulness, with a happiness, with a living in the present, with an aware of things that are too, too great for them. Okay. Now, we come to verse 21. Joseph now, he sends away his brothers, he says to them, and, and it says the children of Israel did so, and, and Joseph gave them wagons, according to the commandment of Pharaoh, gave them provision for the way. And to all of them, each man, he gave changes of raiment, and to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. 
So Joseph gives them wagons for transport, just as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph gives them, give them what they need for during the trip. And then in verse 22, it's interesting. He, he, he talks about clothing. He says he changes the clothing in you know, verse 22. Well, what was that all about? I mean, was that like, you know, I got to tell you guys, you stink. <laughs> when was the last time you had a bath or washed those clothes? You look bad and smell bad. I mean, you think that was it? I mean, the point about giving these brothers change of clothing, it's emphasized here by the fact that he gives one to change of clothing to all the brothers, and he gives five changes to Benjamin along with 300 pieces of silver. Now, I, I don't know about Benjamin. Maybe it was because, uh, you know, it, it, it may have been that Joseph gave Benjamin all this much more because it, he was the only full brother. It may have also been that Joseph was kind of making amends to Benjamin because when you think about it, this was the, there was a particular hardness that, that Zathnath Paneach had been on Benjamin when he was demanding him to come down to Egypt and Benjamin was living under the stress, I wonder what he wants me for. You know, but 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 anyway, coming back to the clothing, it, this was all about maybe we don't know. Maybe this was all about you know Egypt was famous for their linen, the Egyptian linen, still today, and and it's famous. And perhaps Joseph wanted his father to see further proof that his brothers really were telling the truth because look how they're dressed in all this beautiful Egyptian linen clothing. I mean, he would imagine that his father may have a little trouble believing his, his sons. But, you know, and this, if that's tr the way it is, then this is in keeping with verse 23 where it says that Joseph sent them with all the good things of Egypt. But there's another possibility, and it's possible, I'm not sure. But anyways, from, it comes from the Hebrew word for the word raiment, which is the word simla, simla. Now, no one knows the derivation of this word simla, but it's very similar to an, another Hebrew word called simcha, simcha, which, of course, you know what that means, right? Joy, joy, simcha means joy. So it's possible that Joseph gave the brothers these clothes for kind of, as, as a clo celebration clothes, joyful clothes, which would have sent the message to Jacob that happy times are ahead. These are times of rejoicing. Okay, we don't know. Now, but in addition to the transport wagons and the provision for the way and the changes of clothing, Joseph now gives specific gifts to his father in verse 23. And to his father, he sent after this manner, 10 asses laden with the good things of Egypt, 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat, and for his father, by the way. I mean, when it says those first 10 asses that were loaded with the good things of Egypt, I mean, can't you imagine Joseph sitting down and deciding, oh, this is my chance to pick out the best things that are here in Egypt. I don't know. Maybe they had good chocolates there. I'm not sure. But anyway, that would have been good if it was Belgium. But So, so he's got these 10 donkeys that are loaded with these gifts. And it's kind of like when, whenever you get a gift for someone, they just sort of sit down and you think, you know, wonder what he needs. I wonder what would make him happy, you know, kind of like Christmas gifts, you know. But, 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 but so there were these additional 10 donkeys, and they, and, and they were loaded with these gifts. And then there were another 10 donkeys that were loaded with the corn and the bread and the meat. It says meat. I mean, Jacob had probably not eaten meat in a long time. I can't imagine that. And, and, and the cattle, you know, they died off from the famine and the drought. So he was thinking, oh, my father's going to enjoy meat. So when we look at these, this scene here, I mean, we, we can't help but see what it's going to be like when we go to heaven and the Lord is going to send for us, like he's sending, Joseph sending the brothers with the transport wagons and so forth. And the time, you know, and, and, and this, this for Joseph and this time is, is what you would call precious. This is precious. He's sending all the, the comforts and the, and the gifts and everything. And that's the word that's used to describe when a believer dies precious. It says in Psalm 116, 15. Psalm 116, 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And so Joseph, he, he, he's sending these wagons, as Pharaoh had commanded, to carry his father to Joseph. Wagons to carry. That's a picture also of when a saint dies. That's a picture we have of the beggar, poor Lazarus, 
when he died in Luke 16.22. Luke 16.22, it says, it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Yeah. Now, now, okay, now, now Joseph now has prepared all the things that he's sending back to his father in verses 21 through 23. And Joseph now sees that he, he turns now to, to his brothers in verse 24, verse 24, where he says, so he sent his brethren away and they departed and he said unto them, see that you fall not, by, not out by the way. So he's giving them their final send-off commission and the brothers are starting out on their mission for Joseph to bring their father to Egypt. They've been instructed on exactly what to say. They have the 20 donkeys there. I mean, I can just picture this. The 20 donkeys, they're all loaded up with gifts. And they got the wagons to transport their, their father and their families. And they're just about ready for off they go. And we see Joseph there in this big send-off. And he's, he's going through his mind. He's trying to remember everything that, he, that he's got to do in the send-off here so he doesn't get to the after they're gone. Oh, I forgot, and it's too late. So it yeah, must have been quite a sight. I mean, there's 20 donkeys all loaded up. There's the wagons. There's the brothers. They're all saddled up. They're ready to go home. And then Joseph remembers one very important thing and vital instructions. And so we can see him. Yell, oh, see that you fall not out by the way. You know, he says, you know. Now, what's he thinking about, Joseph, you know? Kind of a lot of things. But to fall out by the way means that they would not fulfill their mission. It means that, 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 that now, now what in the world could possibly cause the brothers <laughs> to not fulfill their mission? I mean, that's an important question. That's an important question because we, we, we see ourselves, we should see ourselves like the brothers and Joseph as, our, as the Lord Jesus. And just as Joseph sent his brothers on a mission and gave them everything they needed, we've been sent on a mission too. And we've been given everything we need to fulfill his mission which is Mark 16, 15, March 16, Mark 16, 15, where he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our mission. Uh, you know, the, the, for the brothers, it was go into Canaan and bring back our father. For us, it's go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, one danger that threatened the, the mission, and Joseph must have thought about this. Bo Joseph must have remembered Boy, I can remember when Judah said to the said, said to the rest of my brothers in Genesis 37, 26, Genesis 37, 26, Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is if is it if we slay our brother and conceal his brother? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, he is our brother. And his brethren were content. So Joseph heard Judah propose to sell Joseph for money. And Joseph knew that his brothers were content to do that. They did it. Well, the, these were now the same brothers. These are now the same brothers that Joseph has just put a lot of treasure into their trust. So Joseph might have thought, what if the brothers do the same thing they did to me? What if they do the same thing with these treasures that they did to me? What if Judah turns to them and says like before, he says to, says to the rest of the brothers, what profit for us if we give these treasures to our father? Come, let us sell all these Egyptian treasures. There are probably some Ishmaelites around here. They'll buy it. And what if again it was like he heard before his brethren were content? with another proposal to make money. I mean, maybe, maybe Joseph was thinking, you know, I think I should send a garrison of Egyptian soldiers with them. I think that, you know, I mean, just to make sure they stay on the straight and narrow. But, 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 but you know, and Joseph's thinking, this, no, no, no. Then they would know I don't trust them. So I'm just going to send them, you know, without the garrison of the, of the soldiers, I'm just going to send them with the garrison of my words which are, see that you fall not out by the way. Now that's a picture for us of seeing what God has given to us and, 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 and saying, well, you know, the danger is saying, well, why should I use this for God, what he's given to me to, to bring the gospel to every creature? I mean, I mean, God's given me some pretty nice treasure. Why don't I just use it all for myself? And, and that would be falling out by the way. And so Joseph's words would be like the Lord Jesus saying to us, verse 24, see that you fall not out by the way. Okay, that's one way they could have fell out by the way. There's another way. There's another way. I mean, Joseph also heard 
ben, Reuben. He also heard Reuben argue with his brothers. He, they didn't know he was, he was hearing them, but he did overhear this in, in, in Genesis 42.22. In Genesis 42, 22, it says, Reuben answered them saying, spake I not unto you, saying, do not sin against the child. You would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. So Joseph can imagine, boy, I heard it once. I might, it might happen again. One brother would say to another, it was you that scolded the, uh, Joseph for his dreams. You were the one who scolded him. And he can imagine another bring, brother saying to another brother, you were the one who stripped him out of his coat. And another brother might be saying, you were the one who threw him into the pit. And, and, and Joseph knew if this happens, this will destroy their mission. If they begin with this arguing and quarreling and bitterness and being offended and so forth, if they're going to fall, each one of them, into bitterness, and they're going to fall out by the way. So he tells them, see that you fall not out by the way. And that's the greatest reason today why believers fall out by the way. It's the bitterness. It's the harboring offense at others. It's the arguing. And, 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 why, and why shouldn't the brothers argue? Why shouldn't they argue? Well, first... Because Joseph had forgiven them of everything. And that fact put an obligation on the brothers to not be bitter, not argue, not bring up the past. You know, what, 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 they, ha- what, what they would have done if they did that was to be constantly dredging up the past and going through the cycle of remembering and blaming and accusing and dragging everyone down. And that's what it does with us. This deadly cycle of remembering and blaming and accusing. And so we need the words of Joseph, our heavenly Joseph. See that you fall not out by the way. They they, they had a mission to accomplish. They had a high priority to do. This all these distractions or the allurements of selling it or the distractions of arguing. It's just like just like Nehemiah. Just like Nehemiah when he was building the wall, and Nehemiah said in Nehemiah, when he was when the proposal came to him, oh, come down off the wall, let's have a discussion down here in this valley. So funny, the valley is called, oh no, <laughs> oh no. And so it says in Nehemiah 6.3, Nehemiah 6.3, I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I said, leave it and come down to you? And this is the command the Lord has given to us. He says in, 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 in John 15, 17, John 15, 17, these things I command you that you love one another. And, and, and there's four reasons why we should love one another, why we shouldn't fall out, by the way, by quarreling with others. First, among Christians, first, what Abraham said to Lot, we be brethren. In Genesis 13, 8, Genesis 13, 8, Abraham said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. We should look at each other like that and say, we're brothers and sisters. We will not argue with each other. Second, second, what, uh, what, what, what the brothers said in, in, in Genesis 42, 21, they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the anguish of his soul, et cetera. So th- there shouldn't be arguing because we are verily guilty. We are guilty. We are sinners. And third, and third, we have been forgiven by God. And so because we've been forgiven by God, we should forgive others, as it says in Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. See, grace it not only makes the sin as though it has never been there, but it throws it into the deepest sea. And Micah 7, 19 says that. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it changes its color from scarlet to white as snow in Isaiah 1, 18. And the fourth way, we shouldn't, we shouldn't fall out, because we are on our way, we should not argue with others, because we are on our way to our heavenly Goshen, and many people are watching us. I mean, look at all these things that are happening now in the news, this fall from, uh, uh, of all these uh, uh, politicians for their misconduct. Everybody is watching. Everybody's watching us. It says that everybody is watching us also. It says we have a great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews that is watching us. 
And, and, and the Lord talked about this being watched in, in John 13, 35. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. People are watching us. People are watching us. So for all these reasons, not being a Lord uh, to, 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 to and, and forget our mission by using the treasures on ourselves, uh, not ignore our mission by becoming bitter and offended and argumentative, Joseph, he cries out to them, and the big send-off, see that you fall not out, by the way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. We thank you so much for the words of of uh, Joseph that you recorded to us, Lord, and we pray that we also would not fall out by the way in Jesus' name. Amen.